started. This talk also has a demo in it. So these are some um, effectively uh, darkening filters. Take two and pass it along. Okay. Um, it sh we shouldn't be at the critical point in the talk uh, before the before they come come around. Um, so I wanted to thank the organizers for having me out here. It's always a treat to come visit London, and um, I'm obviously excited to be able to tell you about some of the things we've been up to in my lab recently. Uh, before I get going, I want to just acknowledge uh, some of the people that figured in the development of the ideas and the research that I'll be talking about today. Uh, Victor Rodriguez Lopez, who's a talented graduate student um, under the supervision of Carlos Doronsoro at uh, the Institute of Optics at the Spanish National Research Council in Madrid, and Larry Cormack, who is a an old friend and a member of the Center for Perceptual Systems at, at UT Austin. I um, <clears throat> also want to acknowledge the wonderful current and now I guess some former members of the Burge Lab. Um, makes it fun coming to work every day. Um, <clears throat> and before I really get into the topic of the current presentation, I just wanted to give a brief overview of some of the things we do in my lab. Um, there are really two main branches of, of research that, uh, that uh, go on in my group. Um, this is one of them. Uh, I focus on trying to build um, image computable models for extracting uh, known cues to depth um, from natural images. And then we try and, so we try and find the stimulus features that are most useful for estimating those um, objectively definable sources of information. Things like focus error, binocular disparity, various sorts of motion and surface orientation. We try and find the most useful stimulus features, then figure out how to process them appropriately so you get a high quality estimates that accurately correspond to um, those things in the environment. Then we try and build so those are the ideal observer models. Um, and then we try and match them carefully uh, with human behavioral experiments to try and really work out how the system is, is, is operating. And so one notable, um, a couple of notable uh, results from this line of work, we showed that you can very, very accurately estimate um, whether a lens was in focus or out of focus um, when an image was taken um, from just a single image. So if you take this small patch of image right there, you can work out exactly how out of focus or in focus the uh, lens was when the pho photograph was taken. Um, this obviously has implications for how the eye accommodates and how uh, blur might be used as a cue to depth in natural scenes. Similar style um, types of analyses for binocular disparity and these other cues up here. And today, I'm not going to be talking about any of that. I won't be showing you any natural images uh, to speak of. But I will be sort of integrating these four topics here together. So we'll be sh talking about how focus error, binocular disparity, and various sorts of motion uh, come together in, in processing in the visual system. And um, at, by way of motivating it for this crowd, um, the, the, there's a really general problem that's often not studied, I think, in, in human vision. I think it's much more common to be studied in the computer vision world. You take an example like um, self-driving cars, which has obviously been in the news a lot recently. There are lots and lots of different sensors that these cars have on them. Uh, radar sensors, odometry sensors, um, uh, LiDAR, GPS. All of these sensors are gathering information about the car's position in the world and the things in the environment around the car. And each one of those sensors has, has fundamentally different temp temporal dynamics associated with it. So figuring out how to integrate information from multiple different sensors with different temporal dynamics is a super duper important problem for handling the information that uh, a self-driving car is extracting about the world. It's also super important for understanding how our sensory perceptual systems work. Um, really uh, easy example of this is we know that our uh, visual systems have separate pathways for the processing of luminance and color information, for example. But the color system uh, processes the information much more slowly than the luminance system does you know, to first approximation. And yet, uh, the, the systems have to seamlessly integrate that information without causing problems. Same thing with audition and vision. If you want to go broader scale, the auditory system has much finer 
uh, temporal precision than the visual system does, so it has to figure out how to integrate that information without causing problems. Okay, and so that is a, is a motivating theme for the talk. I'd just like to keep, have, have you keep those ideas in mind. Okay? But today, we're going to be talking about uh, a brand new line of work in, in, in the group um, that is going to touch on those big themes, but we're going to focus on a very particular example. Um, so here's the outline for the, for the primary portion of the talk. Um, first, I'm going to give you a, a brief uh, reminder about what presbyopia is and then introduce uh, what monovision is. Uh, I'll describe an illusion and a paradox that hopefully then convince you why you should care and then um, finish up if we have time uh, with, with the new directions that that work is going in. Okay, so presbyopia, what's this? Most of you are familiar with it. It's the age-related loss of <laughs> focusing ability uh, due to the stiffening of the lens inside your eye. It's why your grandparents and your parents, and now maybe you, have to uh, wear glasses at a restaurant to read the menu, okay? Uh, in the year 2020, two billion people will have this condition uh, worldwide. Obviously, it compromises reading if, there's, if, uh, if, if you don't have it corrected, but fortunately, there are lots of ways of dealing with it. Um, Well-known examples, reading glasses, progressive lenses, and bifocals. And so as a way of introducing monovision, I'll uh, talk to you about how bifocals work. So bifocals, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, left eye, right eye view of the scene uh, through a bifocal lens. There are two focus regions for each eye. One small one, uh, typically focused near, which is why the book is sharp and the background is blurry. And one uh, large region, typically focused far, uh, which is why the bike is blurry, our bike is sharp and the, and the book is blurry, okay? So this works, it's great. It helps you read at the restaurant, read the street signs when you're driving. Uh, but it has this annoying seam and vision which drives quite a number of people batty. And um, so there have been a number of approaches to try and circumvent that issue. Um, <clears throat> progressive lenses is, is one common example where the lens power, there's a smooth gradation of lens power from the bottom to the top of the lens. So if you want to read, you have to look down through the bottom of the lenses. And if you want, want to look at the mountains or the street signs, you have to look out through the top. Many people also find that annoying as well. They don't like tilting their head up and down for those different tasks. And that's where monovision comes in. Monovision it works as follows. Um, instead of having two, fo two or many focus regions in each eye, there's only one. So for example, your left eye might be focused far and your right eye might be focused near, which seems like a terrible idea on its face, right? Because um, you're introducing an asymmetry into the visual system. Um, but for, for folks uh, who accept the correction, um, what happens is that the visual system, the visual part of the brain, uh, preferentially processes the better quality of the two images and partially suppresses the poor quality. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. So just focus on this image here to the left with a blurry book and um, the sharp biker, after the system has adapted and accepted the correction, you might get a, a blended percept, if you will, that looks something like this, where you can both read and see reasonably well at distance without having to make any online adjustments, okay? Um, <clears throat> it's known there's some drawbacks to this. It harms your stereo acuity. So if you make your living as a seamstress, you don't want to do this. You won't be able to thread a needle through the eye, uh, thread, thread a thread through the eye of a needle very accurately. But most people don't need super uh, fine, precise stereo vision to go about their daily lives. And so it's a trade-off that people are happy to make. 10 million people in the United States, I think it's more on the order of 15 million people in Europe are wearing these things right now, okay? <clears throat> okay. One more thing I need to emphasize, because this will recur later in the talk. Um, if the left lens is focused far and you have a far target, that eye's image is going to be without blur, and so it'll be nice and high contrast. Uh, uh, the image that uh, the right eye here is focused near, 
but it's a far target, so it bends the light more than it should. The image gets formed in front of the retina, and that means the retinal image itself will have lots of blur in it, which will lead to a low contrast image. So just remember, uh, blurry image, low contrast, sharp image, high contrast, okay? And of course, depending on which eye has the near lens, that changes which is the high contrast image. Okay, so here's the hook for the main part of the talk. Uh, despite more than 50 years of monovision prescriptions, it's basically not known how blur differences impact motion perception. Okay? And I hope we can all agree that, that accurately estimating the motion of ourselves and objects in the environment is pretty important for not getting hit by a bus. <clears throat> okay, so how are we going to study this? Well, we're going to study this using a paradigm that was, uh, uh, I suppose, originally developed um, to study something known as the Pulfrick effect. So how many people in the room are familiar with this? Brian, you can keep your hand down. I know. <laughs> I know. Okay, so this is good. So the Pulfrick effect is a, uh, was, is a well-known effect. Um, think about, I'll just introduce it by way of example, think about uh, the motion of a pendulum clock or the pendulum of a pendulum clock that's swinging back and forth in the front of parallel plane. Like so. If you happen to look at motion like that through a pair of sunglasses with let's say the right lens kicked out, um, you're going to have a luminance difference between the left and the right eye. And then, rather remarkably, instead of seeing motion in the front of parallel plane, you're going to see illusory elliptical motion in depth. Um, so you'll see this when the motion is actually just doing this. Okay? So what gives? Um, oh, let's, before I explain, I guess I'll let you uh, grind on that for a little while while we do the demo. And, um, so what, you'd like, what I'd like you to do now is hold up these two little uh, pieces of film here. Close one eye. Let's do it in front of your left eye. So put them in front of your left eye. Close your right. Rotate the little pieces of film until the image of the screen is quite dark, but you can still see it. Okay? You probably want to hold them, pinch them together with, with one hand until it's quite dark, but you can still see it. Then open your other eye. Okay? Okay, and so if everyone puts, yes? I think these screens are giving off polaroid light, polarized light. Yeah, that, let's see. No, if you turn them, it, it will get darker, and that's what you want. You want it dark, and, but you want it right up in front of your eye like so. so and you want to rotate into them until the image of the screen through that eye is quite dark. Rotate them with respect to each other. Right? And that will, that will change how bright or dark the image looks like so. So, okay, I got a couple wows. It's good? Okay, if it's in front of your left eye, now ask yourself, is it moving, when it's uh, in front of the screen, is it moving to the left or is it moving to the right? So if it's in front of your left eye, can I get hands for left in front of the screen? Hands for right in front of the screen? Okay, nobody's very confident yet. Uh, why don't you switch which eye has the darkening film in front of them? What I would be expecting you to see in this scenario, if it's in front of your right eye, it should look like it's moving to the right when it's in front of the screen, and when it's in front of your left eye, it should be looking like it's moving to the left when it's in front of the screen. Okay? People, some people are getting happy at this point, I hope. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go see a doctor. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so... All right, so good. You're trying to figure it out. So, so what, what's, what's the explanation for why this happens? Um, when you see the uh, target at that location on its uh, virtual trajectory through depth, it's actually there on the screen. And um, the reason you see it where it isn't um, is because the eye with the darkening filter is actually being processed more sluggishly. Okay? And that causes, because the target is moving, um, that causes a delay. 
All right? And so the effective position of the left eye's image when it's moving to the right is lagging behind the effective position of the right eye's image. So your binocular visual system then stitches together this half image with that half image to give you a perceptive depth there. Okay? Now when it's moving in the other direction, and it's moving to the right, you see it at the, here when it's at that location on the screen. And same explanation, but now because the left eye is processed more sluggishly, the delay operates in the other direction. Right? And so its effective position is here, and then the visual system, again, stitches together the two half images to give you that percept. Okay? So this is all known. It's been known for a really long time. I'm just setting up uh, the new stuff I'll be telling you about today. So, if you've got a left eye dark, you should see left and front motion. Okay? Um, interesting aside, uh, Pulfrick um, built a device that figured prominently into the uh, discovery of planet Pluto. He's also blind in one eye, so he never actually saw the effect that bears his name. Um, and <clears throat> another thing that's sort of fun, this bubbled up into popular consciousness because uh, 1989 and the uh, Super Bowl halftime show, which is obviously big in the States, um, uh, they, Diet Coke released a commercial where if you had a proper type of lens, you'd actually take advantage of the Pulfrick effect to see a, a 3D movie um, uh, of, a, of a Coke can dispense, a uh, vending machine, I think, barreling down steeply inclined streets in San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we're actually, we're, we actually made some measurements, all right? Uh, we did it on a, on a, on a stereoscope. Uh, if you're not familiar, each eye gets its own view of a different monitor. The visual system fuses the two images together. So left eye monitor, right eye monitor, front surface mirror, another one there. These are the two eyeballs. And this is the front on view of that kind of device. In order to change uh, the luminance between the two eyes, whoops, between the luminance between the two eyes, we can just drop down a neutral density filter in front of one eye. We can also do it in software. Um, and then we can make some measurements. So you, you've seen what the stimulus looks like. Um, now the logic behind the experiment was that um, when, you, when you darken one eye, um, that introduces this neural, uh, uh, neural delay. And the logic behind the experiment is we want to find the on-screen delay or advance um, that is equal in magnitude to the neural delay but opposite in sign. So we're going to try and figure out is how much do we have to delay or advance the left eye's image to cancel out the delay caused by the darkening filter, okay? And when that happens, then you should, should no longer see motion outside the plane of the screen. You should see motion in the plane of the screen, okay? So we've got, so this is horizontal image position, this is time, and each one of these basically is indicating whether or not the left eye is delayed on screen, is presented at exactly the same time on screen, or is advanced on screen relative to the right eye. And the data we get out of the experiment looks something like this. We've got on-screen delay on the x-axis and the proportion of times that the subject said front right on the y-axis. And um, as we increase the amount of delay in the left eye, or eventually advancing it, they start saying it moves front right more often than not. What's important about this uh, psychometric curve is the 50% point on the psychometric function, often known as the point of subjective equality. And that says, that's the point where people are saying, I don't know, they're flipping a coin. Half the time they say it's front right, half the time they say it's front left. So we infer as experimenters that that's the point it actually looks like it's moving in the plane of the screen, okay? So this is when the left eye is dark. If we make the right eye dark, you'll see that there's this systematic shift in the point of the uh, point of subjective equality. Um, and so if we just pluck off those points and uh, plot them here on the y-axis as a function of whether the left eye was much darker than the right or whether the right eye was much darker than the left, there's a systematic pattern, okay? So what this says is when the left eye is dark, we need to advance its uh, image on the screen by two milliseconds um, in order for people to see it in the plane of the screen. And if the right eye is dark, so now the right eye is processed more slowly, we need to delay the left eye by two milliseconds or so so that they see it in the plane of the screen, okay? Note that these are really small differences, two milliseconds. 
and it causes this dramatic illusion in depth, right? And that goes back to that earlier point I was making. When you've got two sensors that are going to be integrated and they have different temporal dynamics associated with them, or temporal characteristics associated with their processing of the visual information, it can cause some pretty serious effects. Um, the fact that we don't typically see these effects um, in, when we're walking around indicates to you how exclu exquisitely well our visual systems tend to be calibrated under normal circumstances, right? So a couple of milliseconds really makes a, makes a big difference. Okay, so subject one, subject two, subject three. All right, so now we get to the new stuff. Um, we know that the, if you've got a luminance difference between the eyes, you get a pull frick effect. And the explanation is that the eye with uh, the darker eye gets processed more slowly. Okay. We also know that if you have a contrast difference between the eyes, um, you get a pull frick effect, and the lower contrast image gets processed more slowly. And we remember that when you blur an image, you reduce the contrast. So we asked, but we also know that there's not much work on what happens when you've got interocular blur differences caused by monovision. Well, our expectation is that we would get a pulfric effect, right? Because blurry images are low contrast and low contrast images slow down processing. But instead of a, a classic pulfric effect, we saw a reverse pulfric effect. Instead of left in front motion, we saw right in front motion. And what that implies is that the blurry image is actually being processed more quickly. Okay? And that, of course, seems like a paradox. Um, just to make sure we're on the same page, now uh, when you see it moving front right, this is where it is on the screen, and if the blurry image is processed faster, is advanced relative to the, to the sharp, um, that's going to cause an advance of the position, right? Which again, you stitch the two half images together, and that's why you see it in front of the screen. So, um, Oh, yeah, I'm going to show you data. Uh, so in, to, do, to, to measure this, um, we, we use trial lenses to introduce the blur differences. Um, and then just repeated the experiment. Um, here are seven of 13 psychometric functions for one observer. And now um, you'll notice that the point of subjective equality march in the other direction as you go from left eye blurry to right eye blurry. Right? And so uh, there's the, the points of subjective equality picked off for that first observer. Left eye blurry, right eye blurry, and now you'll notice there's a positive slope instead of a negative slope. Okay? So it, just to be, you know, to, just to belabor the point, um, what this is saying is that when the, the left eye is blurry, it's processed more quickly. So we have to delay its image on screen so that people see the motion in the plane of the screen. Okay? Second subject, third subject. Okay, so here's all the data I've shown you so far. Um, the classic Pulfric data, the reverse Pulfric data for, for three different subjects. Um, it's a new version of a 100-year-old illusion um, that's caused by interocular blur differences. But the paradox is that decreasing contrast causes slower processing. We've known that for a while, both psychophysical studies and neurophysiological studies. Um, and we know that, but, and we've just shown that blur decreases contrast but seems to speed up processing. So what's going on? What we think is going on is this. <coughs> uh, blur reduces the contrast of high frequencies more aggressively than the contrast of low frequencies. Um, and if you're not comfortable with, with spatial frequencies, just substitute in you know, fine detail for high spatial frequencies and coarse detail for, for low spatial frequencies. Um, we also know from the psychophysical and neurophysiological literatures that high spatial frequencies tend to be processed more slowly than low spatial frequencies, all else equal. Um, so what we think the explanation of our effect is, is that um, the blurry image is processed faster because the high frequencies in the sharp image are slowing this one down, okay? So that's, that's what we think is going on. So the question we next asked ourselves is, well, can we actually test for that? All right, so just to make the point here, um, <clears throat> it's possible to reduce contrast without blurring, 
right? So here's an example of a high contrast and a low contrast image that are both sharp. Here's a high contrast and a low contrast image where this one is now blurry, right? So there's obviously a big difference between the properties of the image. We think those differences in the image properties really matter. So how do we go about this? Well, first we repeated the original uh, reverse Pulfric experiment with on-screen blur instead of optical blur, just to make sure we had fine control over things. And we should see, we just get recapitulate what we'd already found, and we do. So this is in one eye, that's in another eye. Um, if the left eye is filtered or blurred, then you need to um, delay it, and if the right eye is filtered, then you need to advance the left eye, right? Same as we already seen. The critical experiment is to compare processing with this in one eye and that in another eye, and that's a sharpened version of the original target. So what we've done now is we've shifted all the the energy and the stimulus to higher frequencies, right? And if the explanation is correct that the high frequencies are what's responsible for slowing down the processing, then this thing should be processed more slowly than that. It should act like the classic Pulfric effect, right? Which is exactly what we see, okay? <coughs> okay, so we think that's at least some preliminary data in support of our proposed resolution of our paradox. Um, what we next wanted to uh, sort out is, is whether this is just some little laboratory phenomenon or whether it might have some implications in, in the real world. Okay? And this is, of course, this is a theoretical analysis. There's lots still to be done. Many questions are probably already popping into your head. I'd be happy to talk about them later. Um, Let's, let's just think it through. So imagine you're uh, behind the wheel of a car, you're pulling up to an intersection, the bike goes past, and uh, <clears throat> you perceive it farther away than it actually is because one eye is blurry and one eye is sharp, right? That's going to cause this uh, misestimation of the depth. You might be wondering, why isn't it going in a circle? Well, when it changes direction when the speed is changing, but if you've got a constant, if it's moving at a constant speed, you're going to see a constant offset in, in the depth. Okay, so let's just put some numbers in because it depends on the, the size of the effect that you're going to see obviously depends on the interocular differences in processing speed. It's also going to depend on how fast the biker is moving. It's going to depend on how far away you are from the biker. It's going to depend on what the blur differences are between the eyes and so on and so forth. But if you take into all of those, all of those factors into consideration, um, <clears throat> We use the most common monovision correction that's out there on the, on the street, about a diopter and a half uh, difference between the eyes. If we assume that the biker is moving at 15 miles an hour, if we assume that you're five meters from the intersection, um, then the misperception of depth is going to be three meters. That's the, uh, that's the width of a narrow lane of traffic, right? Um, so that's potentially a big deal. Um, so the, our tongue-in-cheek recommendation to the ophthalmological community is that you'd better put the, the far lens in the appropriate eye, okay? So if, you, um, if you're in the States, where we drive on the right side of the street, uh, you want to have, if, if, you, if you put the far lens in the left eye, you're going to um, overestimate the distance that the biker is actually uh, at, and so you might break a little more casually, which might increase the risk of collisions, right? So what I say to my American audiences is that you should put the far lens in the right eye. Um, groans, uh, cue the groans from the audience, right? Um, so uh, what we recommend here is that um, you'd want to set it up so that the perceived distance of the biker is actually underestimated, uh, so that you would break more cautiously and, and you know, cause fewer accidents. Um, right. So here in, in England, you would put the, uh, the far lens in the left eye. Um, but of course, uh, these are, aren't, aren't the only two scenarios that you'd need to consider when, when prescribing lenses to people. So it'd be far better if you can just eliminate the illusions altogether, right? And, um, I was staring at these plots and then realized, well, the solution is sort of obvious, right? Um, if, you, uh, if, if darkening one uh, 
eye slows down processing and blurring that same eye speeds up processing, well, let's just put the two together, right? Let's, let's tint the blurring lens. And if, that's, if, if the logic is right, it should eliminate these, these, these effects. And um, indeed, it does, okay? So this is our so-called anti-Pulfric correction, monovision correction, okay? Um, and so that's pretty exciting for us. Um, uh, we're currently trying to interest contact lens companies in, in this, in this uh, potential solution. Um, okay, so intermediate conclusions. Um, we've got a new version of a 100-year-old illusion that's caused by uh, differential blur between the eyes. It links monovision, this, this common correction for presbyopia, uh, to the misperception of motion with you know, potential implications for public safety. And we have shown that uh, anti-pulfric corrections can eliminate the effect for an important subset of distances. You, know, you may notice that if the, the, which is the blurring lens depends on the distance to the objects uh, uh, of regard, right? So um, we can eliminate the illusion um, for one dis set of distances, but you don't, there's no free lunch, so we'll exacerbate the illusion for another set of distances. So what we try to do is, is eliminate the illusion for all distances beyond your peripersonal space. So it works for bikers on the street, but if you have an object whizzing by your head within 25 centimeters, it's gonna, you're gonna be terrible. Of course, if there's an object moving real fast within 25 centimeters of your head, you've probably got other problems, right? Um, so, but, but that it's an important point to, 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 to stress is that we can't eliminate it under all conditions, but we can certainly eliminate it for an, what we think would be the most um, behaviorally relevant set of conditions. Um, uh, so. Okay, and there, there are all kinds of directions to go in with this line of work, as, as I suspect many of you has already thought of. Um, one important thing to, to, to study, which we've already gotten going on, is, is examining the effects of overall light level. Uh, as you, so driving at night. Uh, why, why, what we expect to see is that the illusion sizes should increase at night. Why? Well, in, in low light conditions, uh, the pupil of your eye opens back up, so the same differences and uh, the same focus error will cause more blur, right? And so if you've got the same uh, focus error and more blur, then you're going to have a bigger difference in uh, optical quality between the images <coughs> in your eyes, so the illusions should be accentuated. Um, there are also some neural reasons, which I won't get into, <coughs> that would lead us to expect, even if everything else was held equal in lower light conditions. Um, so I think you may have done some of this work, right? Um, showing that the, the classic Pulfric effect uh, um, uh, is accentuated under low light conditions. Um, um, we'd also need to study the effects of adaptation. Um, so it may well be that after putting on uh, a, a monovision prescription, after a week or two or four, um, your system figures out how to recalibrate itself and, and eliminates the illusion. And there's, there's anecdotal evidence on both sides of this question. Um, the former chair of my department at Penn uh, is a 20-year wearer of monovision contact lenses. And he, when he heard I was working on this, he came up to me and says, I can't play tennis with my mono monovision contacts in. And you know, the first thing I said back was, well, maybe you just can't play tennis. <laughs> and, and he said, no, no, if I've got my regular glasses on, I, I typically beat my partners. And, but he described why he can't play tennis, and, it, and I can show you some plots later if you're interested. Um, what one would expect is that, that, that balls that are moving on straight paths which should actually look curved for him. Um, even ones that are coming towards him to some degree. Um, and that's what he describes um, when he's got these contacts on. Now, on the, on the flip side, um, my former PhD advisor, uh, Marty Banks, who is like Mr. Stereo, I was shocked to learn that he's been wearing monovision prescriptions, which are known to trash stereo vision, uh, for uh, upwards of five years. It might be more like 10 at this point. Um, and he's never 
reported any illusions whatever. Might be big inter intersubject differences, uh, might be that people are just not very good at assessing their own perceptual experience, clearly something that needs to be studied in the lab. Um, another direction of, of interest, which would start tying more closely this new line of work to some of the other stuff I've done, we really want to understand how um, this would manifest um, in the rich visual environment of the real world, right? When there are lots of other sources of information available uh, for the system to, to latch on to and estimate depth. Um, so we're thinking, you know, one, one direction we'd like to go in is, is to uh, get set up with uh, virtual reality or augmented reality uh, systems so we've got fine parametric control over uh, photorealistic graphical renderings. Um, maybe placed into the real world and examine under those types of conditions um, how these effects manifest themselves. Again, you might think under the, under the, in, the, in real world viewing conditions, there's so many other sources of information that might indicate the correct instead of the incorrect uh, mo uh, 3D motion trajectories that, again, this just isn't an, an issue. Um, but again, there's anecdotal evidence that suggests these things can, the big illusions can um, crop up in real world conditions. So a former um, grad student friend of mine, uh, there's an, at Berkeley, um, there's an optometry clinic on the bottom floor of the research building. And he had to go get one eye dilated for some reason or another. And he walked out towards Bancroft, which is on the uh, south end of campus on a steep hill. And there's a coffee shop we, you know, spent most of our meager uh, stipends at uh, uh, during, during school. And he saw a biker coming down the hill at a pretty good clip and just about jumped out of his skin because he thought it was going to plow headlong into the back of a parked car. Well, it's because one eye was getting more light than the other and he had just misestimated the uh, distance the, cy the cyclist was at by about the width of a lane of traffic. Uh, sailed right on by, no trouble at all. So again, that's, that's with the classic Pulfrick effect, but that suggests that um, even when there is a, a in, the, in the rich uh, visual environment of the real world, that large illusions caused by these sorts of temporal differences in processing speed um, can crop up. And then the other important uh, direction to go in with this line of work is to really get an accurate population survey of how prevalent the effects are and, and in people that, that um, manifest them, how large they are. Because again, if we're going to be making noise about these um, results to ophthalmologists all over everywhere, we, re we really better understand um, you know, how, how, how serious an issue this might be in the general population. Um, I'll say a little bit about how we're going about this uh, fourth item on the list here at the, at the, if I've got time at the end of the talk, what are we doing? It? Yeah, ten, minutes. 10 minutes. I also just want to raise a, uh, another, what I think is, is, a, is a very interesting and vexing scientific problem um, before going on to that. And, it, and we're referring to it as the, as the spatial frequency binding problem. So if you remember at the, at, uh, when we proposed our resolution for the paradox, we said that the reason that the blurry image is processed faster is because the high frequencies in the sharp image are slowing it down. Okay? Well, that, that works. We got some data in support of that hypothesis. But if that's really true, that causes a whole other set of issues, which is this. If, you've, if you take a, an image and, say, move it rigidly, we know that our visual system is decomposing that image into its spatial frequency components, right? We've got, it's well known that that's what the early parts of our visual system do. And if each one of those different spatial frequency channels is operating with a different set of temporal dynamics, what it seems like should happen naively is when you make that, move that image rigidly, that the high spatial frequencies get processed more slowly. The fine details process more slowly, middle frequencies processed at some intermediate rate, and the low frequencies are processed really quickly. It seems like that rigidly moving image should now look non-rigid, right? Maybe like um, 
you know, if you watch a B movie where they're trying to indicate what it's like to what it's like to be on a hallucinogen, right? Where the, you get the trailing stuff behind the hands moving left and right, right? Well, that's not typically what we see, right? So what that suggests is that the visual system has some mechanism for binding those different uh, frequency commutes together. And we've got a series of experiments that we're just starting up on trying to first investigate whether there, there is such a binding mechanism by trying to break it. We've got some cases where now rigidly moving images don't look rigid. Um, and then when, it, when they are bound together, what the computational rules are for solving that problem. And just tying back to the original motivation for the whole presentation, I thought this might be a good audience to talk about these issues with because folks who've thought a lot about integrating information from dis different sensors in an engineering application thought maybe someone would be more familiar with that literature than I am myself and something I'm, I'm trying to teach myself right now. Okay. So that's the spatial frequency binding problem. The last thing I wanted to just uh, throw at you, which I think is kind of fun, is a new psychophysical method that we've, we're developing for um, making measurements of interocular differences in processing speed very, very rapidly. Right? If we want to measure from large populations, we want to be able to get high quality data really, really quickly. Because uh, someone in the clinic, they're going to give you 10 or 15 minutes the amount of time it took to collect this data was on the order of four or five hours a person, okay? And that's just never gonna happen. So how are we going about this? Uh, we're gonna try to do this with uh, methods that are called dynamic psychophysics. Okay, so remember what we've, what we've talked about thus far is I show you a stimulus that's doing um, a sinusoidal trajectory, uh, in a sinusoidal motion trajectory and after a, a trial ends, people press a button to indicate what their percept was. We'll call that button press psychophysics, okay? What we're gonna introduce now is what we call rand, uh, dynamic psychophysics or target tracking psychophysics. The idea here is that if we have our target stimulus, just do a random walk, this is time, this is exposition, random walk across time, that's the black curve, and then we measure our subject's response to it, they're told, <coughs> Follow the, the target with a cursor as well as you can, okay? We'll get data back out of the person that looks like this dash sort of smoothed, lagged curve. Then we realize we've processed this the right way. We can actually estimate how long it takes the visual system to process in, in one of these targets, okay? So the task is follow the target as accurately as possible. Um, the analysis to do is if the input motion is white, um, taking the cross correlation of the target motion with the response will give you the impulse response of the system. The visual system, the motor system, the mouse, everything together, okay? But then if we compare conditions and you assume that the mouse dynamical properties didn't change and the motor system's dynamical properties didn't change, then if you take the difference, that should reveal the difference in visual processing, okay? <clears throat> so we, we have people track a target with one eye bright, we track the target with one eye dark. If you miss that, we just drop down that thing again. And then we compare the two, okay? So here's one subject, here's another, tracking a target in X with the left eye only. When it was bright, that's the solid blue line, and when it was dark, that's the dashed blue line. Um, and we looked at it initially and said, oh, didn't work, uh, let's go home now. But of course, you zoom in a little more tightly and you'll see that the, the dark curve is shifted just, uh, the dash curve is shifted just a little bit relative to the solid. The bright curve, the impulse response of the system is a little bit later when the image is dark than when it's bright. And that's, it's also the case in the other eye. So that's the right eye, same exact thing. So we asked ourselves, are the differences in processing speed that we would estimate by comparing the relative lags of these two curves the same, similar, different um, than the uh, estimates of processing speed difference we measured using classic techniques. Well, left eye dark, right eye dark, um, the original data that I showed you from these subjects, those are the gray, the gray uh, uh, squares or gray diamonds, and the estimates of lag that we use by finding the shift up between these two curves are the white dots. And so if you plot those against each other, button press delays versus tracking delays, they're essentially identical. 
And what's cool about this is to gather this data took on the order of a few minutes, whereas gathering the original button press data took on the order of a couple of hours. Okay? So we're really pretty excited about this. I think it's going to open up a whole series of questions that we can ask of humans in a and do it very rapidly in a, in a, um, with pretty high quality data. Um, we also started working on doing tracking in 3D. So now instead of just having it shift left right, we open both eyes and let the target walk in X and in Z. And we, we worked out that um, You'll notice, he'll, so this is a case where the left eye is dark and the right eye is bright. And if you examine how X tracking works, just like you saw before, if you examine how Z tracking works, it's sort of fun. Um, you're seeing this, these huge over and under shoots of the Z target motion, and that's the signature of the Pulfrick effect, right? So you'll notice that um, when the target is moving to the right, you see it as farther away. Right, which is exactly what you guys experienced with the filters. And when the target is, um, so there's a little squiggle having to do with the X motion. Here's another case where the target's moving right and you see it moving far away. Um, there's another little squiggle. Uh, there it's again, it's moving right and you see it moving far away. Here's a case where it's moving to the left and now you see it moving close. Right, so that's the Pulfrick effect manifesting in the target tracking. And so we worked out um, that if you take the human's response in Z and take the cross correlation of that with the X target motion, then what you get back out is the difference between the impulse response functions for the left and the right eye, which is exactly what we want to measure in the first place. right? So we, what we care about measuring is the relative differences in processing speed between the left and the right eye. And it turns out if you do this tracking in 3D, instead of having to measure four conditions, left, bright, left, dark, right, bright, right, dark, you just need to measure it in one condition and you can get out a whole series of predictions. So here's, here's the simulation. So we simulated an observer with one eye being processed slower than the other, simulated this XZ tracking, did the correlation of the Z response with the X motion. And the, the solid lines are the data, and the dashed lines are the predictions. Okay, so that's sort of nice. And that's real data. So, and so 12 minutes, 6 minutes, and I guess there's 3 minutes hiding on there, but it's bad contrast. So, to sum this part up, Tracking, it's intuitive, it's easy, it's fun, it requires essentially no training. You get high quality data in a short period of time. You can use it on non-standard subject populations. Um, kids, uh, um, like anyone who's not familiar with psychophysics, it's quite intuitive. Um, that's the plug for the most recent paper, and yeah, that's it.